Jumping into the next section, uh, we've talked about greenhouse construction, greenhouse heating, cooling, control, water, fertilizers, potting soil. Now I want to talk a little bit about greenhouse gases and primarily talk about carbon dioxide enrichment. We talked about essential elements. We talked about car carbon, hydrogen, oxygen being non-fertilizer um, essential elements. Well, in the greenhouse, we run out of carbon dioxide and oftentimes we're required to fertilize or inject additional carbon dioxide into our system. And 40% um, of the dry, you know, 40% of the dry matter is carbon. Uh, leaves take carbon up as carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They don't take it up from the soil. Um, and it is an essential element and it's part of every plant. It's taken up through the stomata. So the stomata must be open for carbon dioxide chain exchange to occur, which is something I really want you to think about. Because the stomata, if the plants are under stress, water stress specifically, and the stomata close, you have no carbon dioxide exchange. So the stomata have to be open for photosynthesis to occur and have this exchange. And C6H12O6, you've all seen that before, and we won't talk about that. Net photosynthesis on our planet, photosynthesis is what drives our planet. Um, the rate of light energy converted to biomass uh, is shown on this particular chart. This is called a gross primary productivity. And of course, you could see the, the closer to violet we get on the right hand side of this chart is the pho higher photosynthetic rates all the way down to the low photosynthetic rates, which you can see in the arid southwest. Is that just because there's not a lot of water there? That's because there's not a lot of water there and it's because it's hot. So if, if, if in an irrigated field there, in an irrigated field, you would have plenty of productivity. Okay. This, this is a satellite map. Okay. So in our atmospheric conditions, most of our atmosphere is nitrogen. 21% is oxygen. 3.03% is CO2 and 0.97 is the rest. Now this is climbing. Carbon dioxide level is climbing. And it's apparently anthropomorphic. And I'm not going to debate global warming or CO2 or anything like that. But um, indoor, the average level of uh, CO2 in our atmosphere today is considered to be 345 parts per million. Now you go back prior to the industrial age and it was under 300 parts per million. And this is the basics of what we're calling anthropomorphic or anthropogenic emissions, man-made. In industrial areas, we've observed as high as 400 parts per million. And it seems to be increasing about one to two parts per million per year. Most of the carbon um, is actually stored in the ocean. Uh, we have a lot of carbon in oil and gas deposits. We have a lot of carbon in uh, plant materials and trees and shrubs. Actually, believe it or not, a golf course is an incredible carbon sink as it's being as initially developed. And Dr. Yaling Chen in our department has actually calculated the carbon sink or carbon sequestration of a golf course, which is fairly high. Um, but I'm more interested about what is the carbon dioxide fluctuation in a greenhouse on a daily basis. Under normal conditions, 300 parts per million is adequate to support plant growth. That's where our plants have evolved around that number. Most of our plants have good productivity under 300 parts per million. But according to the time of day, this is 6 a.m. on the left, 12 p.m. You can see the carbon dioxide level is just really dropping from sunrise to, to noon because the stomata are open and it's taking in CO2, processing it, and using it up. Now the stomata are going to start shutting down around solar noon because they're water stressed, heat stressed, and they're done. Most of the photosynthetic activity of plants is from sunrise to about midday. That's when plants are the most efficient. So as you can see, the CO2 level starts to go up and this is a blend of both air exchange from outside and also the plant is respiring. And of course at night we get uh, 
high increase of CO2 levels, up to 400 to 450 parts per million in a closed environment. So we need to add uh, CO2 to our crops to maintain good productivity. Where do we get CO2? Well, most greenhouses will use a CO2 burner, it's just a small uh, unvented heater, typically natural gas. Some growers uh, use bottled CO2 or t tanks of CO2, like a uh, 20-acre greenhouse tomato operation will go through maybe a tractor trailer full of CO2 a day. Um, dry ice, of course, works, but it's kind of ridiculous. Fermentation works. Um, and for instance, if you wanted to attach a greenhouse to a fermentation system, such as a brewery, you could get the CO2 that way. Uh, to the decomposition of organic matter. Question? It would be a cool symbiosis between two industries. You're talking my language. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. A mushroom compost inside the greenhouse where that would be decomposition of organic matter. Yeah. So. Uh, I, in Israel, I've heard of greenhouses where they put bunnies in, under the benches and um, the, decom the, the decomposing waste from the rabbits that they're going to eat. Um, that's, there's all kinds of things that you can come up with. However, in floriculture, the most common is a, uh, this is an unvented heater. Um, this is a high quality fuel. It's got to be exquisitely clean, because the only thing I want, the byproduct I want coming out of that burning of that fuel is CO2 and water. Uh, dirty fuel is going to give me other contaminants, other pollutants, um, so they need to be at least 99% efficiency. Uh, we'll, uh, typically we'll use a CO2 sensor to monitor the level of CO2 that's in the greenhouse. CO2 sensors are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper every day. Um, I think I've seen them for as low as $35. So, so here's a CO2 um, enrichment generation system mounted. Um, if we call this a CO2 generator, it's legal. If I call this an unvented heater in the state of Colorado, it's not legal. So uh, we can only put 35 BTUs per square foot unvented into a building on the front range of Colorado because of their elevation. And of course, you want to make sure the thing is running with clear, bright blue flame, no yellow flame. It's got a yellow flame. It's also generating ethylene gas and carbon monoxide. Ethylene gas is going to poison my plants. Carbon monoxide is going to poison you and your labor. Uh, tank CO2 is very common. Um, that's what that white uh, tank is outside of PERC um, for CO2 injection. Uh, it's a lot of growers find that buying their CO2 in liquid form is more efficient. Uh, it is cheaper than, sometimes, depending on the volume you're using, it is cheaper than burning fuel. Or you can use a boiler gas collection system, and this is a, a collection device that takes the, uh, separates the CO2 um, out of the flue gas and separates it from the solid suspended atmospheric particles for uh, putting back into the greenhouse. Um, the problem is, is it's only generating CO2 when the boiler is running. And if you're, you do this kind of a system, it means you have to run your boiler during the summertime as well. And then they pipe the CO2 gas, and this is just a, a plastic tube uh, with the tubing running out through the greenhouse. Um, pressurized CO2 is common. Question. Can you run your boiler without supplying heat? You can run your boiler to generate your CO2 gas and not put heat into the greenhouse. The question, yes, you can. But that's a pretty expensive use of fuel, just to, ger just to generate CO2. That's why the, a lot of these growers use a liquefied CO2 or pressurized CO2 in the cylinders. Small research centers, uh, growth chambers, basement gardeners, they can use bottled CO2. I didn't say that, did I? 
Um, to regulate it, some people will use just a time clock with a little switch to put their CO2 gas. You can use a infrared gas analyzer, CO2 sensor. Like I said before, they are coming down in price all the time. Dry ice fermentation, decomposition, mushroom uh, spawn, or lots of different things that you can do. However, CO2 enrichment is not always a good, exp a good idea. This is a list of species of 30 plus species that do respond to CO2 injection. And uh, whereas if we're going to grow crops like tomatoes, lettuce, carnations, roses, such as that, if we inject CO2, we can increase our productivity. But if you have a crop that doesn't increase its photosynthetic rate by injecting photosynthesis, there's no point in doing it. Because we're typically injecting up to about uh, 1,500 parts per million CO2. Atmospheric CO2 is 300. 1,500, that's an investment. If your plant doesn't respond to with faster growth rates with injected CO2, why do it? So the plants that do respond to CO2, it's usually about 1,000 to 2,000 parts per million. You get more than 1,000, it's, it's very species dependent. But it also is dependent upon light intensity and temperature. It's a Q10 response. You remember Q10? Yeah. What is Q10? You have a response you know, 10 times for every degree an increase of your activity. Photosynthetic is a, photosynthesis is a Q10 response. So to use a greater concentration of CO2, we have to increase our temperature and we have to increase our light intensity. So on a cloudy day, would you inject CO2? No, no. The answer is no. On a bright sunny day, you would. So there's no point injecting CO2 when you don't have a low potential for photosynthesis. Question. Okay, so with global warming happening and the depletion of the and CO2 levels rising, could this, these conditions potentially... Could injecting a greenhouse with CO2 potentially damage, increase the CO2 levels in the atmosphere? It's a spit in a bucket. So, yeah, but like what's happening globally, could it potentially more productive for plants? If we increase the level of CO2 in the atmosphere, could it increase the level of productivity of the plants? The answer is yes. In fact, when you look at the old data from dinosaurs and before dinosaurs when the whole planet was lush and green, the temperatures was also very, very high and the CO2 levels are very, very high. The temperatures are high because it, the CO2 kept the energy of the, of the sun kept that heat energy in, higher CO2, but it currently it would be a completely different climatic system. The sea level, I mean, I think the sea la the Gulf of Mexico, the, the beach of the Gulf of Mexico at that level was probably Baton Rouge, um, so forth and so forth and so forth. Um, is this a potentially good thing? Yes, it could extend our um, frost-free dates to a certain amount, but it's also going to create more heat islands, going to create more unstable, unstable atmosphere, uh, more, more weird storms and such as that. Um, most of the global warming issues are coming from uh, automobile exhaust, coming from industrial exhaust, <laughs> it's not coming from injecting CO2 into a greenhouse because a lot of this CO2 is being consumed by the plants. Um, in my you can incorporate this into your climate control system exactly. Typically what they'll do is everything will be based initially on light. So if the light is low, the temperature will be low and you won't inject CO2. As the light level gets higher and higher and higher, we'll go ahead and inject CO2 and then as we're injecting CO2, we'll increase the temperature again. So we have to integrate the whole system. Right. That's a good observation. So if you were using um, artificial lighting, then would 
you can kind of control all of it. If you're using artificial lighting, you can control all of it, yes. And, and so you can just kind of decide to have like, this now it's day. And yeah, but most artificial lighting systems are not equal to the sun. Right. So, can't afford it. Unless you have a lot. Unless you have a lot. So, back to your comment is light levels moves, so think of the light level as a uh, part of a teeter-totter, and as the light gets higher, we're going to push the CO2 concentration up. As the light gets lower, we're going to push the CO2 concentration down. So, it's pretty simple. Now, based upon what uh, John was saying, in C3 plants, which most of our floriculture crops are, and <coughs> greenhouse crops, is that respiration and photosynthesis is also influenced by temperature. And the uh, graph number, the line number one is our phot photosynthetic rate, line number two is our respiration rate. Plants are respiring constantly. I mean, it's, they, they use the word dark respiration, which is really not a good thing. They say the word dark respiration because it happens in the dark, but it also happens in the light as well. In the light, we want our photosynthesis rate to be greater than our uh, respiration rate, so we have a net photosynthetic or net carbohydrate gain. And as you can see, as the temperature goes up, they both go up. Photosynthesis is going to plateau out earlier than respiration. And once you hit about 38 degrees centigrade, uh, you can see that they cross and at the point where respiration rate is greater than the photosynthetic rate, we no longer have net carbon gain and the plant starts to decline. So between 10 and 20 degrees centigrade is Between 10 and 20 degrees is, is optimum, depending. But it's very crop specific. So we'll program our step controller with our set points based upon whether the heating is on or not. Because if the heating, if the ventilation is on and we're exhausting our greenhouse, I don't want to inject CO2 into a greenhouse where I'm pumping it right back out of the atmosphere because I paid for it. Um, so it just depends on how your system is.